Okay, this video is called Fatty Liver, What Could Go Wrong? Now, the vast majority of fatty liver patients, you can really think of them as essentially diabetes of the liver, and they'll progress with their diabetes and be like the typical, you know, American person, age poorly, hypertensive as well, obstructive sleep apnea, cognitively impaired by the time they're 60. That's pretty typical. What I'm going to show you here, though, is an example of how fatty liver can actually even be much worse than that. So here's the liver in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. So your liver's right up in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen, spleen's in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. Okay, the veins of the abdomen that connect the gut to the liver are shaped like a chair. So here would be the back of the chair. Like the back of the chair here would be the portal vein, which goes right into the liver. And the portal's like a door. It's like the, the gateway into the liver. Um, the splenic vein actually connects up to the spleen. I usually think of it, again, being like a chair and you sit your butt on the splenic part of the vein here. Here's the SMV, superior mesenteric vein. That drains the food from the bowel and then it goes into the liver for processing. The liver is the metabolic workhorse of the body. Here's the IMV, the inferior mesenteric vein. Okay, so normally blood also goes from the spleen and then moves on to the liver. But when you have cirrhosis, which means fibro fibrosis, scarring of the liver, this flow in the portal vein can reverse and go into the spleen. Also, the pressure can be so high that you get these collateral veins called varices, and they can also send blood to the spleen. The spleen is a giant filter for the blood. Um, I'll show you some more pictures here in just a moment of how the spleen filters out old red blood cells. But one of the things a lot of people don't know is the spleen will also filter out white blood cells, and it can also uh, take away platelets. And the point being is you can get a drop in platelet counts and in white blood cells as well as in red blood cells and become anemic when the spleen is markedly enlarged due to cirrhosis and the subsequent back pressure called portal hypertensive. It's all going to make more sense in a moment, but what I'm trying to show you is this uh, fatty liver can be a very big deal. Okay, uh, lots of Americans have fatty liver, about a third of the American population, over 100 million. I can tell you... It's routine. You ask any radiologist, anybody that looks at a lot of liver ultrasounds, I see fatty liver so common. If you hear a history, elevated liver enzymes, LFTs, liver function tests, it's virtually almost always a fatty liver. Chronic right upper quadrant discomfort, the vast majority of fatty liver. Patients come in to get checked for kidney stones, they usually have a fatty liver. These diseases, they all go together. Um, so fatty liver is so common, you just assume the patient has fatty liver because you know all these fat people, most of them have fatty liver, Tons and tons of type 2 diabetics, almost all of them have fatty liver. Okay, um, some of the fatty liver will go on to NASH. So NAFLD is non-alcohol fatty liver disease. NASH is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. It's just the hepatitis component at the end means more inflammation. And that inflammation will subsequently often progress then to cirrhosis. Um, most fat people, most diabetics have fatty liver. Other risk factors, you know, if they're hypertension because it's so strongly associated with obesity and diabetes and prediabetes, will often have fatty liver. Somebody who eats a lot of high fructose corn syrup and all the processed food, they'll tend to get fatty liver. Glyphosate associated with increased fatty liver. Persons with high uh, blood cholesterol, high triglycerides, they often have fatty liver. You know, whatever the reason of their insulin resistance, which again, most often is excess dietary fat, will tend to have fatty liver. So I'm just going to share with you an unusually severe case of fatty liver. So this was a guy, a fat guy. Um, eating the sad diet, no alcohol, and he developed fatty liver that progressed to NASH, non-alcohol steatohepatitis, NASH, and that NASH inflammation progressed to cirrhosis, meaning that the liver is severely scarred, um, and when it's severely scarred, all this fibrotic tissue, excess collagen, that blood coming in will have a hard time passing through the liver because there's so much scar tissue, and it can go backwards into the spleen, plus blood can be diverted through uh, variceals varices and end up going through the spleen and the spleen will get really big so a really big spleen that starts chewing up platelets red blood cells and white blood cells is called hypersplenism and so i'm just sharing with you because i see tons of fatty liver and again most of these patients you just progress through diabetes coronary artery disease die from heart attack okay that's a typical patient but some of the unusual uh more severe cases that go right to cirrhosis um this fatty liver is now a common cause of needing a liver transplant it used to be, you know, most of your, your cirrhosis was just due to alcoholism or hepatitis B, Asian patients, hepatitis C from drug addicts, and for other causes. And um, But nowadays, we're seeing a lot of uh, cirrhosis just coming from this fatty liver.
All right, and so what I'm saying is this big giant spleen, it'll start chewing up platelets, chewing up the red blood cells, chewing up white blood cells, and a patient can even have pancytopenia. Pan means all, so pancytopenia means all the major cell types are decreased. The platelets, the uh, white blood cells, and the red blood cells, okay? And I've seen these cases, and I've seen patients with these conditions, they'll fall down, hit their head, and they'll get intracranial bleeding because their platelets are so low. Um, and I'll see cases where they'll get intracranial bleeding and then the surgeon will have to drain the, the intracranial hematoma, like a subdural hematoma, press it on their brain because otherwise the brain will herniate and they'll die. And it can be a big mess. Sometimes they'll, they'll to cut a hole in the skull is called a craniotomy, but sometimes they actually have to remove the skull and take it off um, a piece of skull. It's called a craniectomy. Um, and they might come back later and try to put it back on in a cranioplasty type of surgery. But the point I'm making is this is a disaster, all right? You don't want this, okay? And it's totally preventable. Don't eat these processed foods. Don't eat these high-fat foods, okay? Because uh, I've seen all this stuff. I've seen all these patients literally with their skull taken off for uh, because of fatty liver leading to low platelets from hypersplenism and subsequent falls, hit the head, intracranial bleeds. So we talked a little bit before about, you know, the ectopic fat theory, largely developed by Gerald Shellman, uh, the idea of where the fat goes. And of course, this also comes from the work of Michael Brownlee, et cetera. But the fat first accumulates in the skeletal muscle, then it accumulates in the liver. So in the skeletal muscle, it causes insulin resistance during the postprandial phase after eating. When you accumulate fat in the liver, that leads to um, fasting hyperglycemia, meaning that the liver can no longer monitor blood glucose levels during fasting and it loses its ability to regulate blood glucose and it keeps on breaking down glycogen and releasing glucose into the blood even when the blood glucose level is elevated. So fatty liver is severely damaging to the liver and the liver loses its ability to regulate blood glucose levels. So you get fasting hyperglycemia. So again, this is postprandial after eating hyperglycemia. When the liver gets fat, now you've got fasting hyperglycemia and eventually you start accumulating more fat in the beta cells of the pancreas, the ones that make insulin, and those begin to fail as well. And once you can't make insulin anymore, then the patient becomes insulin dependent in their diabetes. So that's worse than, typically type two diabetes is initially reversible very easily, almost always, okay? And here's that progression of a normal liver, the liver's becoming fatty, it's often abbreviated NAFL, and you'll typically get elevated liver function tests, elevated LFTs, that's what they're usually called in the medical jargon of it. Um, and then the NASH is when there's non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. The hepatitis meaning inflammation, and the inflammation will typically then progress to fibrosis. And severe fibrosis is called cirrhosis in the liver. It's characterized, let's say, on an ultrasound with a nodular contour of the liver. The internal echo texture also will be um, coarse. So coarse echo texture of the liver is characteristic. That'll sometimes progress to cancer. We've talked about that before because the uh, fibrosis can cause ischemia, some of the liver tissue, and it can transform, transform by Otto Warburg, Warburg effect into cancer. Um, also, we talked about the effect of uh, red blood cells, fat on red blood cells. So first of all, red blood cells, about seven microns in diameter. Typical capillary is about five microns in diameter. A red blood cell, when it passes through a capillary, has to deform and has to fold back on itself to go through the smaller capillary. In a sense, it kind of looks like those little Pac-Man ghost characters as they move around. That's sort of like what a red blood cell going through a capillary looks like. Um, and again, it has to deform a little bit. As red cells get older, they start getting glycated, which stiffens their outer membrane. In addition, they get something called one of the phospholipids in the plasma membrane of the red blood cell is called phosphatidylserine. And it moves from the inner leaflet, it flips into the outer leaflet as the red blood cell gets older. That's called, by moving to the external outer uh, leaflet of the plasma membrane of the red blood cell, that's called phosphatidylserine. Uh, serine externalization, and it just makes the red blood cell stiffer, less able to deform, less able to pass through the capillary. The other thing to remember is your white blood cells are often twice as big as your red blood cells. Uh, even the ones in the blood, like the neutrophils, they can be 14 microns in diameter, so they really have to fold and deform to get through these capillaries, okay? So the spleen is going to have much smaller uh, little uh, spaces for these red blood cells to, to travel through, and that's why it removes the ones that are old and stiff. Okay, when you eat a high-fat meal, you also get clumping together of the red blood cells. The bridging molecules are things like uh, LDL cholesterol, also fibrin, you know, of fibrinogen, the acute phase reactant. Uric acid will do this as well. And you get a generalized clumping of RBCs in something called blood sludge just from the chylomicrons after eating a high-fat meal. But the point is, 
When the red blood cells are all stuck together because of these bridging molecules, you have to raise blood pressure to push them through the capillary because you're pumping thick fluid, a milkshake, higher viscosity blood. So that's why high fat, in my opinion, is always a bad idea because it's always going to raise the blood pressure to push this stuff through. Okay, so you don't want that. All right. Now here's an article, here's the paper, Biomechanics of Red Blood Cells in Human Spleen. And uh, what's this all about? This is showing how red blood cells are filtered out of the spleen. Many of the red blood cells will go through what you would call a more a relatively normal circulation, whereby they'll pass from the bigger arteries to the smaller arteries to a capillary and then exit the spleen. Those are less likely to be removed because it's pretty much like going through capillaries elsewhere. However, some of the red blood cells will percolate through what is called the red pulp of the spleen. And it's a relatively open sinusoidal-like circulation whereby the red blood cells sort of float around. The macrophages, dendritic cells is just another name for macrophage. It's sort of a residential macrophage that stays in a relatively fixed location. But those will sample the RBCs for abnormalities of shape for example, and then the red blood cells will have to re-enter the circulation and they're going to pass through these little uh, gaps, they call them slits, between the endothelial cells and they'll even call them IES, interendothelial slits. And these are pretty tight. And you think of them as being about three microns, that's just a, an approximation, but the point of it is it's hard for the red blood cells to slip through there unless they're quite deformable and flexible. So. Um, if they can't make it through there, the macrophages will just burst and the macrophages will carry them away. They're dead, okay? The spleen is like the graveyard for red blood cells, all right? So the point I make is when you got portal hypertension, you got all these extra red blood cells being forced to keep going through the spleen and the spleen's just removing excessive amounts of them. When it removes excessive amounts of red blood cells, you end up with anemia, Okay, and so then they don't know, is it caused because of the spleen or some other thing? They can do a bone marrow biopsy. The bone marrow biopsy is going to come back normal when the problem is the spleen because it's not the problem is not the bone marrow, okay? Normal in the sense that the, the marrow is not the place where there's a problem with production of the red cells, for example. So anyways, what I'm saying is hypersplenism, a big spleen due to portal hypertension, back pressure from fatty liver having led to cirrhosis, can remove an excessive amount of red blood cells causing anemia, an excessive amount of white blood cells causing neutropenia. Penia means low, so neutrophils, when they're low, you get neutropenia. And it can also cause diminished number of platelets, thrombocytopenia, that's low platelets. And then the patients are prone to bleeding once their platelets are low. Because their white blood cells are low, their immune system is weak and they're at increased risk for infection. Because they're anemic, they're more likely to be tired. Okay, again, so here, here's the story again. You get fibrotic scarring of the liver. Now the portal vein, it takes more pressure to get blood into the liver. So some of it, once the pressure gets very high, it'll even go backwards. Plus, you'll start developing collateral veins called varices, dilated veins, like, you know, leg varices. You'll get varicose veins in here, and some of them will run collateral flow through the spleen. And the spleen will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So a normal spleen is about 11 centimeters or less. You know, it's a pretty typical spleen, about 10, 11 centimeters in its maximum length. When you get this uh, cirrhosis, I'll see spleens 20 centimeters, okay? You know, like about double the normal size. And they're going to be grabbing up platelets, uh, red blood cells, and white blood cells. And that can cause pancytopenia, diminishment of all. And it can lead to other problems, bleeding problems. So what I'm saying is, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Just don't eat these processed fat foods, okay? If you're dying of starvation, fine. Eat them. Eat whatever you can get your hands on. But for any healthy person that has a food choice, it's just stupid to eat these foods. So, anyways, I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, intracranial bleeding due to fatty liver having progressed to NASH to cirrhosis with subsequent hypersplenism and uh, diminishment of platelets, thrombocytopenia. So, a minor fall uh, led to intracranial bleeding. I thought that was pretty interesting.